We get stressed by many things. Lately, the world has been on high alert due to conflict. Belgium was basically shut down for a few days this week, uh, and emergency measures invoked following the November 13th bombings in Paris. France has been edgy. The United States had their Thanksgiving celebrations dampened by a travel advisory to warn of possible danger due to terrors. Some writers are wondering if we're on the verge of World War III. Doesn't help when Turkey shoots down one of Russia's fighter jets. Although our bodies are designed to handle short bursts of stress, chronic stress can be damaging. Chapter 6 about focus in the Daniel Plan, Rick Warren and fellow authors described some effects of stress. Quote, Bad traffic, a big deadline, a fight at home, hundreds of things can stress us out. When the event passes, so does the stress, and we can breathe a big sigh of relief. With chronic stress, however, there is no relief. Stemming from things like family discord, financial hardships, health issues, work conflicts, or school trouble, Chronic stress is unrelenting, and it affects far too many of us. A whopping 80% of Americans, for example, say they feel significant stress and spells trouble for your brain and body. When stress hits, the brain tells your body to start pumping out adrenaline, epinephrine, and cortisol. Within seconds, your heart starts to pound faster, your breathing quickens, your blood courses faster through your veins, and your mind is on heightened alert. Chronic stress harms the brain, constricts blood flow, which lowers overall brain function and prematurely ages your brain. Whenever you feel stressed, your body tries to tell you that something isn't right. For example, high blood pressure or a stomach ulcer might develop after a particularly stressful event, such as the death of a loved one. Chronic stress weakens your body's immune system, making you more likely to get colds, flu bugs, and other infections during emotionally difficult times. Stress has also been implicated in heart disease, hypertension, and even cancer. End quote. So, it's pretty clear that too much stress is not a good thing. We need God's help to face stress and retain hope and health. Our scripture passages today give a couple of examples of stress, both inner and outer, and also suggest some ways we can find God's strength to deal with these. When we're ready for Jesus' return in the long run, it helps immensely to deal with all the troubles we may face in the short run. First, let's summarize some major stressors Jesus urges us to be aware of, both outward and inward. Luke 21, 25, Jesus describes some outward stressors that haven't happened yet, but will cause great distress on earth when they do. There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At this point, We have no idea exactly what form these signs will take. But whatever they are, it seems they will be very major, affecting not only heavenly bodies, but also the earth's seas and tides. Those of ears to hear such events on a cosmic scale will announce that the return of the Son of Man is imminent. The clock is ticking. He who created the universe can suspend what we've come to accept as scientific laws without a moment's notice. Will you be ready? We could categorize these stressors as outward, external. When they happen, it will seem to people as abnormal and fearsome as if the sky is falling. Let's label this type of stressor as circumstances. What bad things beyond your control have happened to you lately? In everyday life, things wear out, break down, fall apart. A couple of weeks ago, my best laptop, a fairly newish model I just upgraded to Windows 10, suddenly quit in the middle of me composing a sermon. The computer shop confirmed this past week my suspicion. A motherboard was fried, just like that. And on Tuesday, when I started setting up our trusty old projector for a small group, later that night, I discovered it too had bit the dust. Fourteen years ago. Not a good month for electronics around our place. You may be dealing with circumstances far graver than equipment that won't work. Accidents happen, relationships fall apart, illness strikes, plants close. Outward circumstances can be stressful. 
Or there can be inner stressors too. Jesus cautions us against some of these sinful desires in Luke 21, verse 34. It says, Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that they will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Here we have internal factors that weigh down or burden the heart according to Jesus. Dissipation. The Greek is similar to the Latin rendering crapula. According to the lexicon, the giddiness caused by too much wine. Also a medical term meaning the nausea that follows a debauch. What today we'd like to call a hangover. Either way, you feel like crapula. Max Jesus mentions our hearts can get weighted down by drunkenness, intoxication, having too much to drink. Besides alcohol today, there's drugs. The news, a 26-year-old Huron County man was arrested in Stratford selling five pounds of marijuana, an amount worth over $22,000. Uh, Jim's mom posted on Facebook about uh, down their way uh, by Cornwall, a $10 million drug bust. Uh, just what, what a amount of traffic. Getting stoned by whatever means is a burden. It renders you ineffective. But the third item in Jesus' list is more respectable, shall we say, the dissipation and drunkenness, the anxieties of life, the worries of this life. The more responsible you are, perhaps the more prone you are to be weighed down by life's worries. Making sure there's enough food on the table, gas in the car, kids get to their events on time, bills get paid, aging parents are looked after, committees are served, etc., etc., are we running so fast we don't have time to breathe? Recall Jesus' parable of the sower and the soils in Luke 8, 14. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. Are we stressed because we're just plain too busy? The regular, routine, well-meaning worries of this life are as capable of weighing down our hearts as less respectable and responsible sins like drunkenness and debauchery. But our texts don't stop at just identifying things that make us stressed. They do suggest five factors by which the Lord equips us to manage in the face of circumstances and desires. First, we're made stronger realizing redemption draws near. We're highly valued. God loves us, treasures us, prizes us highly, proven by Jesus' death on the cross and is coming back to take us to be with him. Luke 21, 27, 28. At that time, they'll see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Jesus, Son of God and Son of Man, is coming. That's what Advent is all about. He came once at Bethlehem as a baby, but will come a second time as Lord, saving his people, setting things straight. Christians believe our redemption is drawing near. This speaks of God valuing us, purchasing our freedom at the cost of his dearly loved Son, the price paid at the cross of Golgotha. Redemption is liberation procured by the payment of a ransom. If you have a coupon and you leave it at home, it's worth only the paper it's printed on. But when you bring it to the store and redeem it, it takes on real value, saving you cost on a product. Jesus' death has meant we can be forgiven for our sins when we believe on his name. His physical return in glory will also mean our own faulty, failing bodies will be glorified like his own post-Easter resurrection body made fit for eternity. That gives us hope in the face of stress. Second, we're given assurance by the permanence of Jesus' words. Jesus makes a draw-dropping claim in 21. He solemnly promises that this generation or race, the Jewish race, will not pass away until all things have taken place. How could any mortal man make such an audacious statement? He couldn't. He would have to have supernatural long-term knowledge, which Jesus had revealed by the Father. He has to underscore the point in verse 33. Can we read this one together? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Where do you get that? What's, 
really real, more real than heaven and earth, more real than the chair you're sitting on, more real than a solid granite tombstone. Jesus' words, they will never pass away. They're more really real than heaven and earth. Reading God's word in scripture is one of the most encouraging, strengthening, buttressing things we can do. Take it to heart. Memorize it. Put it on your walls. Post it on Facebook. Repeat it to yourself. When life gets stressful, run to scripture. Let the Holy Spirit pull out from your memory the Savior's promises for any situation. Here we be strengthened by our attitude, having an eye to the eternal. Jesus emphasizes in Luke 21, 34 and 36 to be on guard, be alert, be praying. He says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation, drunkenness, and anxieties of life. And that they will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. And that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. The Daniel Plan book in chapter 6 on focus lists several suggestions for dealing with stress. Learn to delegate. Listen to soothing music. Consider calming scents such as lavender. Take a calming supplement and laugh more. But their number one suggestion? Pray on a regular basis. Pray on a regular basis. Research has actually proven that prayer calms stress and enhances brain function. Increasing activity in the prefrontal cortex associated with attention span and thoughtfulness. Studies have shown that prayer also improves attention and planning, reduces depression and anxiety, decreases sleepiness, and protects the brain from cognitive decline associated with normal aging. Hmm. If prayer were the fountain of youth, would you drink it? So keep an eye to the eternal. Be on guard. Be alert. Pray, and you'll find God strengthens you. When Daniel was forbidden from praying upon pain of being cast into a lion's den, that didn't stop him. He just went right on praying. Fourth, we find strength in the face of stress by fellowship and admonition. The Apostle Paul faced many stressful situations. In fact, after he'd been in Thessalonica just three short weeks, he was run out of town after people rioted. him. 17. Writing to the infant church there a short time later, he's quite open about how much encouragement he receives from the fact of their existence. First Thessalonians 3, 9 and 10. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what's lacking in your faith. Hear that? He's thanking God for them. Just knowing about them, having met them, Thinking back on their response to his messages. Hearing from Timothy how much they long to see Paul again. This gives Paul great joy. He's not saying to himself, I got run out of town, I'm never going to back there. No, there's some real attachment there. All the joy that we feel because of you. We pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face. He deeply longs to be with these sisters and brothers in Christ again. Paul also is eager to restore whatever is lacking in your faith, as he says here. He doesn't mean there's something defective about their capacity to believe. Your faith here refers to depth of content. He's had a scant three weeks with them, barely enough to lay a doctrinal foundation. He has so much more instruction he wants to share with them. He does so somewhat in chapters 4 and 5, teaching on sexual ethics, work attitude, end times, general conduct, and so on. It's the basis for Paul's admonition. Does he just talk off the top of his head? You see his method back in Acts 17, verse 2. It says, as his custom was, uh, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. How proving? Did he magically conjure Jesus to make an appearance? Of course not. He proved it using <coughs> scripture. So we encourage and strengthen one another when we share biblical truth and promises with each other. Bible studies, small group, coffee break, women at the well, simple SMS text. 
any occasion we can find to study and share God's word becomes a means of strengthening. Are you keeping track of where we've been? Our stress busters, redemption draws near, permanence of Jesus' words, an eye to the eternal, fellowship and admonition. The fifth and last stress buster is the Holy Spirit's overflow in love and holiness. Look at 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13. Paul says, May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts. Who's the subject grammatically in these sentences? May the Lord make your love increase and overflow. May he strengthen your hearts. The Lord operates in our lives through the agency of his Holy Spirit. Love is the first fruit of the Spirit, listed in Galatians 5.22. We can maybe manufacture a little bit of love on our own, but we need God's grace desperately to produce that overflow Paul talks about. I don't know about you, but when it comes to being a loving person, I leak. My inbred selfishness just naturally creates a pinhole in any loving tendencies I have, so I need God's pumping up. I was looking through a Canadian Tire Black Friday flyer and noticed an ad for a Coleman Double High Air Bed with AC pump. It says, airtight system, guaranteed not to leak. Hmm. How many of us have started out on an air mattress at the beginning of the night? By the morning, it was a severe letdown. When it comes to loving others, we need the Holy Spirit's overflow, his abounding in love to pump us up, to give us a surplus to share with others. It's not just about warm fuzzies. The Holy Spirit is that. Holy. He strengthens us in love, but also in holiness. Verse 13 in the NRSB says, And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be, what? Blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. He strengthens us in holiness so we can be without fault, without blame, innocent of Jesus coming. He prunes away those sinful desires we talked about earlier. Dissipation, drunkenness, being weighed down and consumed with life's worries. Keeps us God besought, God satisfied, affirmed in Christ. So we don't need this world's props and idols to fill that gap. Johnny Erickson Tata, at age 65, has been a quadriplegic ever since her diving accident 48 years ago, age 17. She's faced an unusual amount of stress and disappointment in her life. This week at a piece for Fox News in time for the American Thanksgiving, she reflects on how caring for others, abounding in love, we might say, will help make this world a less stressful and conflict-ridden place. Johnny writes, it means thinking the best of others, always telling the truth, forgiving even when you don't feel like it, not cherishing inflated ideas of your own importance, defending the reputation of a friend, speaking out on behalf of the abused, the poor, and the elderly, and praying for your enemies. I'm grateful that Paul's timeless words, here she's reflecting on Romans 12, 17, 21, Paul's timeless words are as good a guide to us today as they were to early Christians. For these words transcend religious distinctions and denominations. Evil may seem to have the upper hand right now, but humanity is always triumphant when people simply act humanely toward one another. 